Hello, good day. And actually, a good day is right here in particular because I'm about to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, an Australian, Nicholas Gruen. Nicholas, can you switch your camera and mic on and uh, uh, join us? Hello, Nicholas. <laughs> We've lost Nicholas. Um, Nicholas, can you hear me? Can you put your camera and microphone on? Ah, good. <laughs> I don't know what turned it off, but um, it automatically right. turns off at that that point. Welcome, Nicholas. Um, we're, it's great to have you here. Uh, Nicholas Gurren is a uh, a very well known economics commentator in Australia uh, who frequently appears in the news challenging the status quo uh, uh, and the, the the big economic institutions in Australia uh, in particular the sort of um, neoliberalism that has do dominated the organization of uh, uh, of policy you probably won't like me using that but the micro economic reform and um, and um, uh, elements of policy that's Dominated Australia really for since the late eighties, wasn't it? Um, the the, the uh, early 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 eighties. Early eighties. We 80s. got ones. Uh, Tony Blair was copying Bob Hawke and uh, and uh, Paul Keating in Australia, yeah. who was there about eight years before him. So uh, you you led that we can really blame you for uh, most of it. <laughs> well, we did you know, we did neoliberalism with a little more attention to trying to keep uh income equality in some sort of order uh, but it's uh but otherwise we shared a lot of the bad things of neoliberalism brilliant right so nicholas is going to be talking about the competition delusion and how it's spoiled everything and uh i i'm looking forward to his talk and we'll leave him to it go for it nicholas thanks Okay, radio. Here's my now. Uh, if you can confirm, Henry, that the slides are up on the screen in a way that everyone can see, they are now. Okay, okay. Uh, now I've got to do something. Got to change. Okay, so this is uh, this is. Uh, I'll be talking for about 25 minutes, and then I'll be very interested to hear people's reaction and um, get some discussion going. So here are two people. Uh, they are fighting out the Australian Open 2017 final. And um, I want you to ask yourself a question. It might sound like a simple question, which is, are these people competing? Uh, and I think you will find that they are competing. But I also want to suggest to you that that night, uh, they did quite a lot of cooperating. And uh, if I were to ask you, in what ways did they cooperate? I think the, I think the easy answer is to, um, is to divide the evening up by time. And then you would be able to say that they were cooperating when they came onto the court and they were hitting up. Uh, and after their competition, they were cooperating. Uh, you can see that Rafa Nadal probably less keen on the cooperation than Roger Federer, but uh, they were cooperating once the once the game was over. Um, and uh, so that's that's one way to think about competition and uh, cooperation or competition and collaboration, and that's essentially thinking of competition and collaboration as poles. So, uh, so in one, you know, at one end you've got cooperation, at the other end you've got competition, and the at the beginning and end you had lots of cooperation, and in the middle you had fierce competition. And it's that sort of thinking that is behind a lot of economic thinking. Uh, it's obsessive in economic thinking because you, it's pretty hard to meet an economist for whom the most fundamental uh, category in their mind is this distinction between competition and cooperation, which also gets mapped onto 
the public and the private. Competition is always for private benefit. That's why we, uh, Roger Federer is trying to help Roger Federer. He's not trying to help Rafa when they're playing the game. Um, and so here are some public goods, defense forces, street lights, urban water. They're things that we can, they're economic uh, commodities that we can't provide ourselves except in a cooperative arrangement where we all cooperate and get our government to supply them. Here are a bunch of private goods and they tend to be supplied uh, by uh, private markets. And there's lots of competition. If you don't like one restaurant, you go to another. If you don't like one toy, you buy another and so on. And then there are all these things in the middle and debate goes on and on about whether they should be provided by the government in a cooperative way or by the market in a competitive way. And over the 80s and 90s and noughties, we moved these things. We, we moved our whole intuition from the idea of providing these things uh, cooperatively towards providing them competitively. And there's lots, there was lots that was quite good about that. There were, I think, in many ways, even more things that were bad about that. But that's not the competition delusion. That's the world of competition and cooperation as uh, poles on a spectrum. And that's a perfectly reasonable way to think, but it's an incomplete way to think. And here we have our friends, Roger and Rafa, and this is where they're competing. And I've put that green circle around the whole thing. Because what I wanted to say to you is that their cooperation was not that important at the beginning and at the end. There was nothing testing it. If they wouldn't cooperate very well, well, that wouldn't matter too much. But there was a way they were cooperating when they played the game in which the more they cooperated, the better the competition was. And that cooperation was around the rules of the game. And we care so much about the rules of the game as a public good, as a thing that will be provided in common, whether you're Roger Federer or Rafael Nadal, that we provide an independent umpire. And the competition delusion is the idea that competition might be quite good in that umpire's chair. And, I, and, and as I will go on to explain, that goes on all the time in all kinds of really subtle ways. And it's playing a major role in wrecking our economy and far more importantly, our society, our lives together. Let me try and explain what I mean by contrasting the legal procedure in English speaking countries with legal procedure in European countries. Might sound like a, a, a fairly rarefied example, but I think it'll help you get the hang of it. The, the process of adversarial legal procedure in English speaking countries is based on the competition delusion. Because you see what it's doing is it's saying that we can build a public good and that public good is justice. That public good is the, a shared solution to a partisan problem that both sides hopefully will accept. But if they don't, they will be made to accept by another public good called police forces and our legal system and so on. And under the adversarial legal procedure, the role of the umpire is a very muted one. Of course, we need one because we've got two partisans, but we basically let the partisans run the procedure. What do they do? They put their case. They're the ones who take the case wherever it goes. They're the ones that control the evidence. Critically, they're the ones who decide how much evidence to go and chase because, of course, in most cases, there's an infinite amount of evidence that you can go chasing. 
you can go chasing emails of everyone, you can go chasing time logs, you can go chasing people's medical records, and so on it goes. They even uh, bring on into the stage their own experts. There are complex laws of evidence, and the result is that uh, English speaking adversarial legal procedure embodying and embracing the competition delusion is much more expensive and much more unfair. So here's a representation of inquisitorial legal procedure, uh, which is the case in, in different forms in Europe. Uh, Germany is a classic example. Uh, the Northern European countries, I think, have pretty efficient legal systems. Uh, but generally, Europe has an inquisitorial system. And the big difference there is that there, the judge is in charge and the judge is there, an independent party, to find out the truth and deliver their verdict. The parties have lawyers. The parties can put, they, the parties can hold the judge to the law but the parties in that sense are assistance to the judge, not the other way around. It's the judge who controls the case. It's the judge who decides how much evidence is the right amount of evidence, because if it was a case for $100 million, you could afford to spend a lot more money on evidence than if it was a case between two neighbors for $5,000 for a barbecue gone wrong or whatever. So they determine the extent of the evidence. They choose court experts. They put themselves on the line to work out who the best expert would be. And the laws of evidence are very simple and straightforward. And the difference is that this, what you're seeing there is the sort of thing that happens in a court in Germany or in Sweden. And this is the kind of thing that is uh, quite possible, uh, very easy to drift into in an English speaking court as both sides try to jockey for position. Uh, to give you an idea of its impact on fairness, this is a quote, from, uh, sorry, this is, um, this is about legal expertise. Um, and here's a quote from a, a US legal scholar about what happens when the, the, the expertise available to the court isn't its own, isn't expertise that it has chosen, but rather the expertise of one partisan and the expertise chosen by another partisan. And I think you can guess that that's not going to work very well. It's as, as he says there, can you imagine a better way to lead to systematic distrust of experts than to have two partisan experts rather than to find an expert in which you have some confidence. And this generates lots of economic incentives for experts to slant one way or the other. If you're an expert uh, and you want to get a lot of uh, lots of good money representing plaintiffs or defendants in uh, tort cases, in liability cases, well, um, th that's a way you do it. It's also extremely unfair because in that situation, the side with more money and more power and more contacts is able to do a great deal better than the other side, uh, which will run out of money fairly quickly, as was said to Andre Geem, the inventor of graphene, when he was at a conference and he was talking to a, a person from a multinational company about patenting it and they told him, don't bother patenting it because if you do try and patent it, we'll be we'll put a we'll put a bank of property intellectual property lawyers onto the case. We'll patent everything around it. Hundreds of patents will tie you down in legal in a morass of legal uh, activity uh, until you're bankrupted. Um, another way in which the competition delusion uh, gets into our system is independence for hire. So if you're the Her Majesty's Treasury in the United States uh, or a, an agency in the US government or the Australian government, your books will be inspected if, if 
if the person wants, if the Auditor General wants to inspect your books, that's the auditor you get. In the private sector, you get to choose your own auditor. Now, auditors do operate according to standards, but the, what the, but where the real money is, is where the money is in a, a court of law in an adversarial system, which is in bending the rules away from the public interest towards the private interest of your client. Another kind of independence for hire, famously in our financial system, is ratings. So before the global financial crisis, and still today, uh, if you had an exotic uh, parcel of securities uh, full of junk uh, bonds, you could uh, pay Moody's uh, or Standard & Poor's uh, to rate them. And of course, they they then play a double game. They have to preserve some degree of reputation or no one will be interested in their ratings, but they're also interested in clients. The result was that uh, those ratings agencies rated a certain exotic new securities as AAA and they were worth nothing at all. This happens in government with things like regulation review statements where uh departments putting through regulation are required to present a regulatory analysis to prove there's not this this isn't over regulation and of course if an agency is trying to get regulation through of course they can manage a regulatory impact statement and bias it in their favor same with environmental regulation and so on and so forth there's another thing that needs to be thought about which is the role of information in competition. Here you have two standards. Uh, this is in selling food on the right hand side in selling uh, fuel consuming goods on the left hand side. And what's happened there is that a standard has been developed in which very simple information can be imparted and that information is consistent across soft drinks and cheese and any food, and it's consistent no matter who is selling it to you, whether it's Coca-Cola Corporation or the local, uh, the local supermarket co-op. And that is critical to allowing competition to work its magic, because when it works well, competition does work magic, but now we have that familiar pattern that I'm talking to you about, which is that we have firms competing for private benefit and that standard is a public good and it is built by cooperating for shared benefit. Doesn't have to be provided by the government. The, the, the one I showed you was ultimately mandated by the government with a lot of cooperation and involvement by private industry. But there are standards, for instance, those standards that run the internet that are not run by governments. They're run by all kinds of interested parties cooperating. Uh, so there is a completely different logic to what happens at the firm level where competition is appropriate and what happens at the level of trying to ensure that the information architecture reflects cooperation for shared benefits. And the competition delusion arises from firms or competitors manipulating the rules as you play the game. That the firms are manipulating the rules of the game that they are playing. And you can see why that is going to be a dodgy prospect, I suspect. Let me try to give you some uh, idea of what that means. Um, but this happens in finance, it happens in medicine, it happens in law. Each of these professions and, and a number of others are in a position to generate the demand that they then go to satisfy. The result is that this is the American financial market. The Australian financial market is fairly similar. Um, I, the British financial market, at least uh, given 
what a large exporter of Britain is, it might actually be worse than that. This shows you the share of GDP dedicated to finance from 1920 to 1940. You can see the kind of financial structure that produced the Great Depression in the 20s, uh, how it was squashed flat by World War II, where so much financing was done by commandeering things by the government. That's not ideal during um, during peacetime. And it recovers in a much more sophisticated market by the 70s back to about 4%. That was probably pretty healthy. It's now double that, but all of that expansion hasn't been in value adding. It's effectively been in predation on other sectors, which are effectively drawn into this process of having to insure uh, uh, and having to participate in financial markets. As asset prices go up, people have to borrow more, et cetera, et cetera. Collecting the rent with law, you can see on the right-hand side, the countries which have an adversarial system, and they are about four, they are as bad as four times as expensive as good systems running an inquisitorial system. And here are the here is the American healthcare system, the system, the only system in which private interests dominate the architecture of the sector, with the exception of Medicare and Medicaid, which are mostly for poor and older people. Uh, and you can see the dramatic impact that that's had. Twice as bad, in fact, more than twice as bad as finance simply to fund the US medical center system, even as um, life expectancy is actually and remarkably falling. And those kinds of things are an important part of the story, according to which more and more of every dollar that is that tr changes hands in the economy goes to the, the holders of capital, that is to profit as opposed to, to employees. Uh, and as you can see remarkably, the even though profits fall in big recessions, uh, the total share of wage earner income falls by more as a share of GDP. And that's just the economy. <laughs> uh, so now I want to, and now you know why I'm, I really meant it when I said how it's ruining everything, because the competition delusion, whether we acknowledge it or not, is running a riot in our public life. And the way to understand that is to understand that democracy and public life is governance, governance by conversation. Of course, there's lots of, there's, there's other things that go on, but it depends upon the sense people can make out of a conversation. And the thing about a conversation is that a conversation has private goods and shared goods. The private goods, I might wanna compete with you, I want, might wanna prove to you how clever I am or how stupid you are, who knows, but that's a private, that, that's me following certain private drives. And if we can't both together treat the conversation as a kind of cooperation, like Roger and Rafa, there's the competition within a cooperative framework, then we don't actually have a conversation. We have a kind of neurotic exchange, which feels like a, feels quite like a conversation, but is in fact not a conversation. It's two people trying to take advantage of each other and no genuine meaning to, uh, is exchanged. So here, the, this diagram that I showed you earlier, We'll get rid of the, the sport and we will say that debate is a kind of competition, but it takes place within the larger, uh, fr the larger frame of discussion, compromising and framing the terms of discussion itself. And what we have in our culture, and I won't go through this slide, I don't have time, but I will assert to you that we live now in a culture that has been optimized by competition, uh, and uh, I've I've just uh, I've just highlighted there at the bottom of the screen those things that have been intensified by social media. In other words, what I want to say to you 
is that this isn't just, uh, I, I, this is not just a matter of, oh, now we've got social media and can't we go back to before social media. Before there was social media, the foundation for having a democracy was well and truly on its way to being shorn from beneath our feet. Uh, if you can't get the President of the United States on US network news for more than nine seconds a soundbite, you don't, you, it's not going to be long before you end up with Donald Trump's and various empty headed uh, people who are optimized for sound bites and all the rest of it. If we look quickly at information and competition, think about PR and think about journalism. Um, I don't want to tell you that journalism is all good. There's lots of things wrong with journalism, but the difference between PR and journalism is that PR is quite specifically trading in information for private benefit and journalism, uh, the purveyors of journalism, journalists are, if they really are journalists, paid by uh, publishers and broadcasters seeking an audience. And to that extent, they represent the interests of the audience, not the interests of the providers of the information. And if you look at those graphics, which may be a bit small for you, um, in 2004, a reporter made 71 cents for every dollar that a PR flack made. In two, by 2013, that number was 65 cents. And the number of PR flax went from 3.2 PR flax uh, per journalist to 4.6 PR flax. So winning elections now fast foodifies democracy. To simply become a politician, you have to beat the competition. Once a politician, your party eternally competes with others. You compete for media attention. And as media outlets compete for, for uh, and you do that as they compete for the public's attention, everyone is relentlessly optimizing their offering and you can see what kind of an offering it becomes. And so the question is, um, I'm thinking quite a few people in the audience will be thinking at this stage, well, yeah, but that's democracy. Democracy is about elections. Well, I don't want to stop elections, but in fact, there was a democracy which wasn't about elections. There were almost no elections held in ancient Athens. What there were, were uh, what is what remains in our legal system, another part of our legal system, I, will, I would hasten to add, um, which is, small groups of people chosen by lot from ordinary citizens. And that has, and that's now increasingly turning up in citizen juries deliberating over uh, political questions. Are they, do they compete with each other? Well, if they want to, if there are people who disagree, they will have that out in the jury. But the logic of the jury is a unitary logic. The logic of a jury is to come to a conclusion uh, and whatever they, by, by whatever means. And so the road rage in our current electoral democracy, if you if are involved with these things at all, it's extraordinary to see that, that dissipate. It's extraordinary to see how intelligent people can be together, working on, you know, playing to each other's strengths uh, and deliberating on issues. So. Uh, I'll, I'll conclude by saying that so far, citizen juries have almost exclusively been run for the benefit of politicians because they're the ones with the budgets and they're the ones that everyone goes to because people think that democracy is about going and asking politicians to back various things. And I've been in this game for a long time. Don't bother. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to try to build a pathway in which we can have such institutions in some ways compete with the existing electoral institutions. For instance, if we could raise the money to simply run a standing citizens assembly chosen by a lot from ordinary people, it would get a lot of press and it would put a lot of pressure on existing legislators and existing executives, existing prime ministers and presidents uh, imagine what a citizens 
assembly would be saying right now about the way Donald Trump or Boris Johnson, for that matter, has handled COVID. The replete or Brexit. That's another long story. So that's the sort of thing that I'm arguing we can do and should do. And the destination to crystallize this for you is that in the 19th century, out of all the struggle from the French and American revolutions in the late 18th century through the 19th century to the early 20th century, we moved, we, we established these, this bicameral system, a lower house representing the people with elections, an upper house representing some kind of aristocracy, which was, which was often by elections. And I like, I like the idea of having an upper house. It could be a third house or it could replace existing upper houses. And it would be chosen by lot as we did in Athens. And the lower house would continue to be uh, appointed, uh, would be continue to be elected as we do today. So that's uh, my, my um, proposal and uh, very happy to see if uh, see what people make of it and uh, get the discussion going thank you hi nicholas I, that's great Th thank you very much for that <clears throat> um it's amazing how actually this sort of encapsulates maybe you know the fundamental uh, problems in our society in a way and the, and the influence of economic thinking has had on the very core of, of of how we live I mean you start from I love the way you started from the sort of tennis game and then you know and and the and the small sort of items and then went you know like the whole uh, showed how really the whole of our society has been corrupted as such is that fair yeah I would guess it is if it is uh, I mean uh, they're strong words and I, I often sort of back off strong words because I spend a lot of my time trying to persuade powerful people and I don't like strong words, but uh, corrupted in the same way that in a subtle sort of way, it doesn't mean anyone is on the take. It doesn't mean it, it's all been, it's all been uh, packaged up with a system and, and, and it's been distorted by just small decisions made by people, partisans, who, you know, just uh, lean on somebody to do the right thing, help them out of a jam. And, uh, and, and essentially the very important obstacles, um, uh, the very important structural, um, uh, the, the very important structures that prevent conflicts of interest from gradually polluting the environment, they're all, um, quite muted now, much more so than, than uh, they have been. Uh, there's a, a scholar of um, uh, financial, of the financial markets, a person called Carolyn Sissoko in California, who writes about the 19th century financial markets in which the law of agency was incredibly pivotal. And the law of agency said, if you act on one person's behalf, you can't act on somebody else's behalf if there's a conflict of interest. Well, that's what our banks do all the time. Uh, the the uh, Goldman Sachs in the run up to the global financial crisis was marketing securities in one, with one arm and advising clients to sell them in the other. Uh, so you have a, a corrupt sector and, and we haven't fixed, uh, we, there's, there's very little that's been done to fix any of it. Can you, by the way, can you just stop sharing your screen and then that will, um... Just so that. Uh, no, I'm, I'm in great uh, difficulty because I can't. Once I press not, not sharing my screen, it. Uh, here we go. Maybe this. No, I've no idea how not to do okay, that. No, I'm sorry. The controls at the bottom. If you press the same button, you use. Yeah. I can see nothing. I can see. I know. I sound oh, like Sergeant Schultz. Oh, I, I, see. Can, I can see nothing on my screen, so I can't do it, I'm afraid. I can. Try and go back in if you want me to. I can try and go back into the uh, okay, okay into the system. Um, uh, hang on, I just found a way to do it. No, yes, okay. Now I'm in. And uh, what would you like me to do? Uh, yes, uh, I'll stop uh, sharing uh, my screen. Stop sharing the screen, and then we'll uh, then. Yes, yep, bigger. Brilliant. Okay, great. Now we've got um, 
two uh, uh, questions for Andy Chapman, um, how to communicate. Let's let's bring Andy onto the stage. We'll try um, uh, try that. Um, Andy, can you put your, um, yeah, there we go. Andy, thanks for joining us. So, Hi, thanks, Henry. Hello, Nicholas. Uh, that was a, that was a really interesting talk. Thank you, thank you so much for um, sort of encapsulating so many interrelated and quite complicated things so um, beautifully. Um, I guess my, my question is really about. Um, I mean, I, I entirely support what what you're sort of saying here, and my question is about how do we how do we kind of um, engage the wider public with this story because. Um, I, I work with the economy for the common good, and we're, we're a, an organisation founded on the principles of grassroots dem democratic um, participation. And um, when you when you start talking, I mean, in my experience, when you start talking to people about how um, you know politics is is corrupted and and uh, the adversarial model is is the problem, and we need blah blah blah. People sort of say, yeah, but, you know, it's never going to change, is it? And, and it, it's actually quite hard to get them to um, engage with what could be done in its place that's different because they have no experience of it. And I, I was wondering if we could come up with a snappy thing like um, the present government and Dominic Cummings are genius at doing, like, get Brexit done or, <laughs> What's the uh, or levelling up. It's like we, we need to find some kind of really powerful, pithy, punchy way of communicating the central idea here. And I just wonder if you have any thoughts about whether that's possible or desirable. Uh, yes, I have a thought, which is that I've been involved in this now for quite a while. And I, I, and I hope you'll take this in the Socratic sense in which it's meant. But uh, I think what you've said is very much part of the problem, not part of the solution. So what you're saying is, Dominic Cummings is out competing me. Hmm. And you're after a hack. You're trying to hack democracy like he's trying to hack democracy and everyone's trying to hack democracy. So this is a hard problem. But I think if you think about it from the ground up, there are huge opportunities. They're just different opportunities to the way that we've become habituated to do politics, which is hardly surprising because we are habituated to a system which has its own logic. So I've been trying to think, I'm not a stranger to politics, I'm not a political animal particularly, but I'm certainly, uh, you know, I've worked in politicians' offices, I've, and I've been on this bandwagon, so much of a bandwagon yet, is it? But uh, I've been on this message for five years or so, fairly seriously. And your problem is that the politicians will like the ideas but don't want any discomfort from the current situation. And the public hear this stuff and it's like you're offering, the, you know, it's like they, they think, oh God, I'm being invited to do a PhD here. Uh, I'm busy, you know. Um, and so the question, so they're not, the public have never been very good at, at um, uh, absorbing fairly abstract messages. And if they, and, 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 and I'm, all, I'm a believer in finding some wisdom in that, because if they were to fall for some abstract messages, guess who would get hold of the abstract messages? <laughs> so an alternative is the alternative that I gave you, which is, I mean, you know, Margaret Mead and um, both Margaret Mead and Vladimir Lenin had the same approach to social change, which is that it's highly um, motivated, relatively powerful, not necessarily, I mean, intellectually powerful, well-connected people. They can be a small group of people and they need to pursue a kind of a logic. So before COVID struck, I was involved in trying to organise a crowd-funded and community-funded, and let's be frank, plutocrat-funded citizens' assembly in the two recalcitrant countries, Australia and the United States, uh, to be held around about now, hasn't happened as you can imagine, to 
um, discuss Greenhouse and to send a people's delegation to Glasgow for the Conference of the Parties to uh, 2020, uh, number 26. And I think that would have electrified the media. Uh, it's really just a bit of a stunt, but people would have seen it and they would have, I like to quote that scene from when Harry met Sally when the, in the restaurant where the woman says, I'll have what she's having. And I think people would have, would have, look, uh, there would have been a lot of people looking at that saying, actually that, I can, I, I can see the logic of that. But if you go out there and try and get grassroots support for an abstract idea, you're you're playing on Dominic Cummings' uh, terms, and um, uh, and you won't get there. Thanks, Andy. Do you want to do it? Um, yeah. Should we? Now we've got next question. Are there examples of countries' governments that are heading in the right direction and can serve as an example of the effectiveness of a changing? Yeah. Yeah. So so there are a few examples since 2011. Uh, the Oregon, uh, the state of Oregon in the US has built this into their constitution. So they have the embarrassing problem. A lot of people like the idea of citizens initiated referendums. I don't particularly, uh, but what they found was that they were being hijacked by the wealthy and the powerful. Surprise, surprise. And they moved a situation, they brought about a situation where a citizens initiated referendum cannot be held without a citizens of review, which involves a four day conference of 24 people from Oregon, citizens of Oregon chosen at random to deliberate on the referendum. And you can see quite large swings, both in the citizen jury over the period of deliberation and in the population when they find out what the citizen jury thought. Um, more Promisingly, still in a in the German-speaking province of Belgium, uh, there is now a standing citizens' chamber uh, playing a role not entirely unlike a uh, which is to uh, uh, to to influence the notice paper of the legislature uh, and as a standing chamber, which is also able to appoint other uh, other the citizen juries. Uh, this is quite a small province of Belgium, but that's very promising. And we'll start to get some experience from that. Um, uh, Madrid also has a standing citizens chamber, but it is shared, as I understand, by a politician from the, uh, from the, uh, the other uh, elected chambers. So there are some things happening. You've also got the big, um, the big sort of, um, hoopla with uh, in France and in Britain with citizen assemblies on climate change and they could be quite useful but their relationship to power is quite a, a quite unclear and they're effectively advisory and and uh, once they're advisory and they're set up by politicians you'll be able to see politicians and powers hands all over the ways in which they operate so I think it's important to try to find ways for selection by lot to become its own form of activism. Uh, so we've got a bit of a way to go, but I think it can, done right, I think it can explode into public consciousness quite quickly if we can get some, some uh, really worthwhile investments from people and from people with money to start running this thing without anyone's permission and show the kind of thing that it's capable of. Yeah. And by the way, I might say, Nicholas, um, you know, maybe you could do an international version of this on a platform like this. Well, you can. But remember, I did use an expression during the presentation, which is road rage. And the Internet has to be handled with considerable care because people's anonymity, uh, their distance from each other uh, can fuel road rage. We, you don't need me to tell you that. Just go to Twitter or Facebook any old time, or Twitter more than Facebook. But um, not platform. You have to be identified. You have to have a. You know, you could be selected into. These are actually. This is a private space, so you have to register to get in. You have to put who your name is. You have to be there. So it's um, all it does is try. It means practically, you can involve, you know, people from all over the world. No, yeah, I, it's 
it certainly shouldn't be rule. Uh, this is this is a very useful adjunct to it. But there's quite a lot of good evidence that actually being in the room with someone, uh, spending some time with them, actually yeah. changes your behaviour. I don't know whether it's happened to you. It's happened to me a couple of times in my life where I myself was suffering a bit of road rage. Someone had cut in in front of me or I thought they'd cut in front of me. I might have stood on the horn and really given them my a piece of my mind. And then it gradually occurred to me that this person that I'd just done this to is my next door neighbour and we're both driving home. <laughs> and I'm, what what have I done? This is mad. I'm mad. You know, why did I do that? Why didn't I? Why wasn't I presumptively generous to the, towards this person um, as I would have been if I was in the same room as them? Yeah. So there are there are lots of quite subtle things, uh, but but definitely we should be using these these kinds of tools. Uh, but I would I think it's actually quite important to uh, build up from actual personal interaction as much as possible. But again, these are the things that we have to work. These are the things we have to work with um as we uh as we go and see where it takes us see what evidence you know see what works and what doesn't work i i've invited adam up because he asked uh, uh, questions and in which i think to some yeah, extent he commented on um yeah. has anything been missed out adam or um or do you have a follow-up question from what i think yeah because nicholas mentioned um like someone with money could uh like fund an independent standing citizens assembly uh but isn't that already a problem because those who have that kind of money tend to be the people who are already in power uh well yeah the the, the short answer is yes the longer answer is maybe no most importantly um you have a governing body that uh is auditable and a set of rules and principles and um and 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 I think the the main downside of that is really that the the people who want to oppose this thing will say, oh well, it's big money. But if you think about it, it's a pretty easy way to insulate the the uh, to to insulate the deliberations from the money that is funding it. Uh, that's essentially that was one of the main appeals of selection by lot in Athens. Athens is the only democracy that I know of that thought of itself as forever in a war with oligarchy, which occasionally would the place would flip into oligarchy. It did a few times with the help of the Spartans. And the idea of selection by lot, that everyone did this, that no one could be influenced, because if you try and influence someone, they're off the assembly after a year anyway. They can't do you any big favours. So there are all kinds of ways in which this mechanism provides you with very strong guarantees. But unfortunately, and, and, and in the longer run, of course, you don't want uh, wealthy people funding a thing like this. But, but uh, uh, activists have to find common cause with whomever they can find common cause with. So long as they're not compromising themselves to a degree that they find is counterproductive to their to their mission. Okay, and then my second question was: uh, you was you were saying it was better to have independent citizens assemblies rather than state-run issue-based ones. Uh, sorry, state-run ones. But if you look at issue-based citizens assemblies, the state-run ones, for example the Irish Citizens' Assemblies on same-sex marriage and abortion, uh, and also potentially the French one on climate, seem to have had a lot more impact than, say, the University College London-run Citizens' Assembly on Brexit, which had practically no impact on the debate on Brexit. Um, they suggested uh, basically a customs union Brexit, but which Parliament just rejected and no one it didn't hit the news or anything. Um, so, what do you think about that? Is there value in having state-based rather than state-run rather than independent citizens' assemblies? Well, the I'm not. I don't want to be theological about it. You take what you can get when you're trying to change when you're trying to change things. Uh, so, I would welcome all of those initiatives. I happen to know quite a bit about the London-based one out of the out of uh, uh, University College, and uh, I mean, I wrote a piece in the. Guardian about it, 
it was a bit outrageous, really, because what happened was the organisers uh, that you might remember, it was 2017 from memory, and you might remember that there was a huge amount of propaganda at the time that now we've done Brexit. And anyone who want, who was seeking to litigate, re-litigate Brexit was massively attacked by the tabloids and all the rest of it. So the people putting on the Citizens' Assembly spent all their time in PR and in writing up the Citizens' Assembly, um, hushing up the fact that, in, that, that, that they kept saying, well, it's not about whether we go ahead with Brexit or not, that decision has been made, this is just about the kind of Brexit. That was a pure spin-based, uh, that, that, that was a piece of spin from them. That was a piece of issues management, if I can use a, a more Orwellian term than spin. The fact was that if you looked at the numbers and you had to kind of poke them and persevere quite a bit to get these numbers, if you looked at the numbers, you ended up with the 50 people involved in the Citizens' Assembly going from uh, their, that they were selected to split um, 50 to 48% in favour of Brexit so that they were representative. And by the end of the process, about eight had changed their minds, every one of them away from Brexit and nobody had changed their minds in the other direction, which produces a huge swing towards, uh, and, and my, my contention on that basis was that Brexit in, I think it was June 2016, was the opinion of the people and the considered opinion of the people was strongly remain. And that was hushed up, uh, but it, it's there in the numbers. And the fact that the swing was all one way also improves your the confidence with which you can say that wasn't just because the sample size was small. The chances that that's luck is the same chances of, of tossing a coin and it coming up the same uh, and it coming up on the same side eight times in a row. Uh, not very high. So we have very good evidence, uh, but it was all hushed up. Now, uh, yeah, the, the, then the question is uh, anyway. So, so uh, you know, the organisers of these. We're going to have to wrap up a bit because we're just about coming to an end. Okay. But uh, um, uh, thanks, Adam. Um, thanks, Adam. Nicholas, have you got any final um, remarks before we close? <laughs> but I think you've covered things absolutely brilliantly. And it's been a fascinating discussion. It's been great having people on the stage also to, um, to get involved. Adam, if you just switch your camera and uh, uh, the microphone off, that's brilliant. Um, so any last any last statement of uh, of hope uh, uh, and uh, encouragement to the people here who are trying to develop ideas and propositions um, yeah, yeah. I guess I'd get back to my original uh, suggestion to the first person who spoke to me whose name I'm afraid of uh, has Annie, escaped me now Annie Tucker, yes. Annie, that's because they're both starting with a you're trying to confuse me um, <laughs> and and what I'd say is um, I'm not, this is an appeal to, this is not an appeal to be terribly intellectual about anything, but remember I'm talking about a different logic, a logic that we have lost. And if, and, and if you believe in the ideas that I've put, don't just do the normal activism around those ideas because it won't work. Think of an, an activism that is suited to this idea. That, and in fact, I'll leave you with a word that is not in our language, but it was in either, either because it's an ancient Greek word, but the, but the, the concept is not in our lexicon. It's not in, in, in the way we speak about democracy. The Greeks had a number of principles around which they um, oriented their democracy. One was called parhesia, which is translated as freedom of speech. It means something rather different. It means the duty to speak power truth to power really but they had another concept which we just don't have any kind of notion of in our society and yet once it's mentioned people go oh yes that we are missing that 
The word was isegoria, and it means equality of speech. And if you don't have a university degree, our democracy has no place for you as a decision maker. You can be a pro, you can vote, but you're not going to represent anyone in parliament. So in a population like the UK, where slightly under 50% of people have a university to ed education, over 95% of their parliamentarians have a university education and there is no equality of speech. So it isn't surprising that that's tearing the world apart and that those people who don't have as, uh, as much education in their makeup end up voting in a rage for Donald Trump and for Brexit and for Marine Le Pen. Uh, they're right to be angry. Uh, they're wrong. And, and what happens is their anger is toxified by our system, by having to be commoditized, by having to be turned into some formula that can be explained in, in eight seconds. And that'll be nationalism or retribution against people who won't toe the line. Uh, it doesn't, that won't work, that won't end well. Uh, but I've got lots of faith in people, in ordinary people. Machiavelli, sorry, I'm going on a bit, I'll finish uh -huh. it. In right up, yeah. Machiavelli had this idea that the grandi, the powerful, the wealthy, the oligarchs, they're insatiable. They'll always want more. Jeff Bezos, I don't mean him any personal harm, but if he gets $100 billion, that's not enough. He wants more. And that isn't true of ordinary people. Ordinary people want to lead their life and be live and let live. And we can build a democracy around that sensibility. And we, we're, we're so far from it. It's not possible. It's not funny. But the ways to do it are, I think, fairly clear if you have a good think and are prepared to try some things. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Nicholas. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. And um, uh, keep in touch and see how we go. Thank you. Okay. And best of luck with Brexit and... <laughs> well, and COVID. And COVID. That's right. That's right. And around okay. the world. We've got an international audience. So um, okay. thanks very much, everyone, uh, for being here. We, um, we, we are lucky this afternoon to um, welcome Rupert Reid, uh, who's the UK XR spokesperson one of them and to talk about uh, uh, uh system change from uh, climate change and so on and uh, so that should be great uh this evening or, or later on this evening also we start half an hour early this afternoon with a welcome sort of to help you navigate the system at half past four and then at five o'clock uh we repeat the the same session uh for the briefing as this morning followed by a workshop so if you were enjoyed it as much or want to come back and be part of the workshop do um and but it may be the middle of the night and so we will see you hopefully on thursday morning um at 7 30 for an intro and uh, a sort of but you'll hopefully you've done that um and eight o'clock to actually start the session so farewell thanks nicholas and um mm -hmm. back to the floor do before you go do complete your profiles uh, you can stick around and chat to people and um, complete your profile so people can see who you are and for further reference. Thank you and uh, out for the moment. Cheers then. Bye. Bye-bye.